product, I decided to give it a try. Everyone who has an overactive bladder knows what I mean when I say it was worth a try. It's a very annoying condition. It's worked for me to this point. My frequency seems to have dropped to the levels of what it was when I was a lot younger before I had this problem. Another one from Liberty or Death 94 in the Lone Star State. He says, I bought a bottle for my dad. He noticed results within a few days. Glad to know there's something out there that works. Amazing product. You can see those reviews and many others like them again at our site, InfoWarsLife.com. Free shipping till midnight tonight, and we've extended as a thank you the discounts on the products that we sell until midnight tonight. Now, getting back to what Ben Carson had to say, he wasn't saying that there should be a litmus test as to someone's religion. What he said was he didn't think that Islam as religion was compatible with the Constitution, perhaps. And he didn't even go that strong. He said if it's inconsistent with the values and principles of America, then, of course, it should matter. You know, actually, when we look at Joe Biden, who is now sitting on the sidelines, as I said, Biden his time, I think that he has picked up all of the uh, people that have left Hillary Clinton. Certainly, Hillary Clinton has, has dropped 20% in the polls. And Joe Biden, even though he hasn't announced, has picked up those 20%. And when I look at what Joe Biden has to say, it concerns me as much as Sharia law that he doesn't understand the foundations of of our government, of our Bill of Rights, of our Declaration of Independence, of our Constitution. He fought with Clarence Thomas on the whole concept of natural rights during the confirmation hearings. I remember that distinctively. It's the first time I'd ever noticed Joe Biden. He was absolutely incensed at the idea that we would possess natural rights, whether they're from God or whether you want to say it's just because we're human. Our founders said that we were given those rights by our creator, that they were therefore inalienable. Many, If you're not a Christian, understand that you possess those rights as a human being, if you wish. Nevertheless, those rights are not as a human being. If you are a human being, you have these rights and they're not given to you by the government. They're not privileges that are granted to you, but they are fundamental rights. That's what Joe Biden has a problem with. And we need to understand that our government was set up to protect those individual rights. That's what the Declaration of Independence said. It said to protect these rights, governments are instituted amongst men. And that when the governments become destructive of those rights, we have the right and the duty to alter or abolish that government. That's the fundamental principle of America. And so when we look at Islam, take a look at what the embassy of Saudi Arabia talks about in terms of legal and judicial structure. They say since Saudi Arabia is an Islamic state, its judicial system is based on Islamic law. At the top of the legal system is the king who acts as the final court of appeal and as a source of pardon. It's a very, uh, very much a king system that we broke from. So it's a very different approach. But here's what they have to say as well. They say in Sharia, there is no difference between the sacred and the secular aspects of society. And that's what many people are concerned about. The Islamic countries do not share our tradition, our constitutional mandate that there be a freedom of religion. They do not accept that. Saudi Arabia, our great ally, has beheaded more people than ISIS has. They're notorious for their... Uh, their, their intolerance of other religions. That's what concerns everyone about it being compatible with the Constitution. They say, of course, that Muslims derive Sharia law primarily from the Holy Quran. And, of course, when we talk about Islam, we need to understand that there's many different variants of it. There's Wahhabism, which is Saudi Arabia. There's the Sunni Islam, which is in Iraq. There's Sharia, which is in Iran. And, of course, there's going to be differences with individuals. Nevertheless, the concern that we have, and I think what Ben Carson was talking about was, are they going to respect the principles that we have embedded in the Declaration of Independence, the principles our country was founded upon, and the principles that are in the First Amendment? Because we've got an article on InfoWars that 33% of the people in America can't name a single aspect of the First Amendment. Maybe that's a good question in the next presidential debate. We'll be right back. At the end of the last segment, we just started talking about an uh, article that's on Infowars.com. 33% of the American people can't name a single First Amendment right. That's a recent poll that was taken. I would like to see this kind of a question at the next debate by the GOP. Tell them, name one 
of the Bill of Rights besides the Second Amendment and tell us what you think it's about. Or take one like the First Amendment. Can you name the different aspects of the First Amendment? Here's what that poll found. They found that 57% of the people knew that, the first, that freedom of speech was in the First Amendment. They found that only 19% knew that freedom of religion was in it. Only 10% mentioned freedom of the press. Only 10% mentioned the right of assembly. And only 2% knew that the right to petition was in the First Amendment. Now, 33% of the people couldn't name a single thing. That's what is truly amazing. Truly amazing. So I'd like to see some questions from the presidential candidates. Uh, name some of the ask. Tell us what your favorite one of the Bill of Rights is and why. Just give us, you don't have to quote it verbatim. Just give us a general idea of what you think it's about and uh, tell us why you like it. That would be truly amazing. I don't think we would get uh, much of a difference from... Uh, from that as we do from this poll, I, could, I can imagine some blank stares from many of these candidates. Now, Donald Trump has put out a statement, a very detailed statement about the Second Amendment. Uh, and, of course, his position papers, he's only put two of them up, only two positions about issues. Immigration and now the Second Amendment just came out the last couple of days. But he's been fairly detailed on that. Let's talk about his position on the Second Amendment. It starts out very, very strong. He says the Second Amendment to our Constitution is clear. The right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed upon, period. That's a great start. The rest of it he talks about is also good as he, in the preamble, he says the Constitution doesn't create that right. It ensures that the government can't take it away. Exactly right. Rights are things that we possess, as I was saying in the last uh, segment, that we possess as human beings that are given to us as human beings by God. Government is instituted to protect those. If you grant things to people, those are called privileges. They're not called rights. But then he goes on to say, this is about self-defense, plain and simple. Mm, not exactly. Not exactly. That is certainly an important aspect of why we have those rights. But we also possess those rights to protect our country from foreign invasion, from insurrection, from dictators. Okay, the Second Amendment is there as a check against the abuse of power by our own government, not just foreign governments. The first line of defense was not a standing army. As a matter of fact, they did not want a standing army. There were provisions about how the army needed to be taken down after the ends of wars, uh, not a permanent standing army. They considered that to be one of the greatest threats to our liberties. And I think that we have seen that is the case. It was the mil militia that was supposed to protect us, not the military. So it is not about self-defense. That is one of the things that uh, we have that we enjoy as a right, but it is not about self-defense. But let's talk about some of the specifics he has to say. Enforce the laws on the books, he says. And he talks about how there's violent crime in cities like Baltimore and Chicago. Ignoring the fact that that crime is there because of the war on drugs. And, of course, Donald Trump is talking to the Republican base you're not going to hear the Republicans criticize prohibition, unfortunately. They still haven't got it. They still didn't learn anything from alcohol prohibition, and they haven't learned anything from the 44 years of the war on drugs prohibition that we've had. And they also don't understand that they don't have any legal or constitutional authority to prohibit it. As I've mentioned before, we have the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment stand as a testimony. Just in case you don't understand what the 9th and 10th Amendment are about, the fact that if the government isn't explicitly given powers, those powers remain with the people, remain with the states. In other words, if you don't give a power specifically to the federal government and say, this is yours to regulate, they don't have that power. And so they had to give themselves the power with an amendment to the Constitution. That's what the 18th Amendment was about. It amended the Constitution so that they had the power to prohibit alcohol, alcohol alone. And that was revoked in the 21st Amendment. Where is the, where is the amendment to prohibit any other drug? Or not just recreational drugs, medical drugs, drugs that you might need to fight cancer. Why would you allow the FDA or the DEA to deny something that you believe you should have? See, we had tolerated that, and now what we're staring at down the barrel of is removal of our informed consent when it comes to vaccinations because the principle is the same. If you don't own your body, they can deny you medical treatment or they can force you to take medical treatment. They can also say that this is harmful for you, so we're going to throw you in jail or kill you if you are involved uh, with using this. So it's really the war on drugs. It's not 
the possession of guns that's dangerous. And I would like to see the Republican Party understand that and promote that. Once they do, I think they'll get some traction. But he says we have a dangerous war on drugs. We have drug dealers and gang members that are given a slap on the wrist and turned loose on the street, so it needs to stop. So he doesn't acknowledge that prohibition is really the issue. He goes on then to offer mandatory minimums, which we've seen fail in the war on drugs, for violent crime. And I understand that if you're going to send somebody to jail for a, a felon, for a violent crime that they used a gun to, I, I don't have a problem with them getting stiff sentences. But I do have a problem with mandatory minimums, even though uh, Eric Holder, who called it a cookie cutter program, even though he did not get rid of mandatory minimums. We've seen that used against nonviolent offenders. And understand that what's really behind that is an effort to fill up the private prisons. That's really what's going on there. I don't think that uh, we're going to solve anything in this country by throwing even more people in prison. We already have more people incarcerated than any other country, including China and Russia. But then he goes on to talk about fix our broken mental health system. Again, we need to be careful because a lot of Republicans have jumped on the bandwagon to say that guns are not to blame, crazy people are. And I understand there's been a lot of shootings by people who are mentally disturbed. We have tried to point out over and over again that in every one of these cases, if you look at them, they've been prescribed some kind of pharmaceutical. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors are a favorite. They make people more violent. They're prescribed for people who are suicidal or violent in some way, and yet it exacerbates that condition, especially when they come off of those drugs. Yet again, they do not acknowledge that system. And we have to be careful that if they say that someone is mentally incompetent to own a gun, who makes that determination? Are we going to have a due process to make that determination? Is this going to be a federal program to determine that? Are we going to have a jury to determine that. If you're going to take away somebody's right to own guns, that ought to be considered the same type of due process that you would have in order to take away uh, their rights to throw them in prison. I think there ought to be a jury trial. I don't think it ought to be done on the orders of a doctor. I don't think it ought to be done with a checklist of uh, different things or the accusation of uh, friends or family or neighbor. It needs to be, once an accusation is made, then take it to a court and adjudicate it just as you would if they were charged with a crime. Once you did that, I think that would be reasonable. But also, acknowledge the fact that a lot of this is caused by SSRIs. But then he has some good things to say about gun and magazine bans. He said the government has no business dictating what types of firearms are good. Honest people should be allowed to own them. Again, I'm reading from Donald Trump's recently released uh, issues statement on the Second Amendment. Then he goes to background checks, and he points out that very few criminals are stupid enough to try and pass a background check. They get their guns from friends, family members, or by stealing them. So the overwhelming majority of people who go through background checks are law-abiding gun owners. Exactly right. So why not get rid of it? Why not get rid of the background checks that were put in to appease uh, Ronald Reagan's, uh, the, the wife of one of Ronald Reagan's friends? Why not get rid of those? Because they're totally ineffective. He says, we, don't, we need to fix the system we have, and we need to make it work as intended. What we don't need to do is expand a broken system. That's Donald Trump's program. So I don't really understand what he means by fixing a system when nobody is really using it. But finally, he talks about a national right to carry, and I want to talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The last segment, we were talking about Donald Trump's newest issue statement. He's had two. One about immigration, the other one about the Second Amendment and uh, the rights of gun owners. Both of them are very detailed, and there's some good aspects in both of them and some things that I would disagree with. Not so much things that I would disagree with, but a little bit soft on some of the edges. He has a very strong statement with the uh, Second Amendment uh, rights issue statement saying that it is clearly a fundamental right. It is not something that the government grants to us. Nevertheless, he talks about how it is about Self-defense is about much more than that. I would like to see a broader understanding of that. Also, some things we need to be careful about when he brings in mental health. We've seen many in the uh, conservative uh, movement who typically understand and protect Second Amendment rights trying to trying to push back against gun control by saying we need to get tougher with people on the mental health issue, ignoring the contributions of pharmaceutical drugs like SSRIs, and also ignoring our due process. We've seen how the VA has tried to take guns away under ridiculous pretenses from veterans. 
uh, how they have used the auto deposit of checks, uh, disability checks, to say that uh, you're incompetent and therefore you're going to lose your uh, 